Hey, thank you very much everyone for attending. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, and welcome to the first um, ICMRBS Early Career Research webinar. Um, so I should say thank you very much to the ICMRBS for giving us the opportunity as early career researchers to present our work. Um, and if you'd like to speak at a future event, um, please email one of the committee members. So there were five people um, that organized this webinar. Um, so I think uh, it'd be worth introducing them briefly now. Um, so one was me, I'm Nick Fowler. I'm a postdoc at the University of Sheffield, um, UK. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, so the other members can briefly introduce themselves. Yeah, sure, I'll Hi. start. Um, oh, sorry, I'll go. Um, Hi everyone, so I'm Yanni, I'm from Australia, um, Brisbane to be precise, and um, University of Queensland. Um, so I've been postdocing um, um, here for um, ooh, quite a few years now, um, but um, I've been working on solution state NMR structural, um, structural biology and mostly on um, um, animal toxin peptide sort of thing. So um, it's nice to, nice to see you all. Hi everyone, my name is Reed. I'm a postdoc in uh, Lewis K's lab at the University of Toronto and thank you for joining. Hello, I'm Carol. I'm from Brazil, but I'm studying my PhD at Monash University of Australia, Melbourne. Good to see all of you here. And I, I think I'm the last one. Uh, this is Angelo. Uh, I'm uh, a postdoc in the lab in Greece, in Patras, at the University of Patras now. I've been previously postdoc in, in Florence, chair, and uh, later in UK at Warwick University in Holy State. And welcome all to this meeting. Right, and then back to me. So all the details for the webinars going forward will be found on our website and also our Twitter. Um, and you might also want to join the ICMRBS mailing list. Um, so here you'll hear details of, um, from there you'll hear details of this webinar, but also everything else the ICMRBS does. Um, so if you want to join that, please email Kevin Gardner. So this webinar is going to happen on the last Tuesday of each month. Um, and time might vary to accommodate speakers from around the globe. So today we've got someone from the UK and some people from the US, um, but we're hoping to get speakers from Asia, everywhere else. So the time might change to, to accommodate them. Uh, and so some people don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to attend. Um, the format will be three scientific talks, um, 15 minutes each with five minutes for questions. Um, and then we'd also like to have one kind of session that isn't about science so much. Um, so we have a poll. So if you go down to the bottom of your Zoom thing with Bob, um, you should be able to see the poll button um, and please respond to that. That's asking you what you might like to hear about in that non-scientific session, um, if, if anything. Um, and then after that, um, we'll have some time for social networking. So what we'd like to do is invite anybody that would like to join um, the panel so we can see you and, and hear you. And, and that might be a little bit of an experiment. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work. Um, but if you want to chat to any of our speakers, that would be a great time. Um, so before the talks start, I'd um, just quickly like to say, um, please don't record or share any of the talks. Um, some of our speakers have given permission for them to be recorded, um, and we will upload those to the YouTube channel. Um, and finally, if you have a question, um, please type it into the Q&A box um, and raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, we'll read your question out, but if you raise your hand, we can, we can turn you on so we can hear you ask your question in person. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to pass over to... Um, I'm not sure who I'm passing over to, but somebody who's going to introduce Alex, our first speaker. Carol. Hey. Carol. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. So I'm going to introduce Alex Guzman. He's a postdoc at University of Pittsburgh with Angela Grunborn. Alex grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and he attended the University of Maryland at College Park for his undergraduate study. At Maryland, he first became interested in NMR spectroscopy while doing undergraduate research with Dr. David Fishman. Alex then decided to head, up, head down south to pursue his graduate degree at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where he obtained his PhD study under Dr. Uh, Gary Filak. Alex 
synthesis work used the fluorine and the mark in studies to probe the thermodynamics of the protein protein interactions in phys physiologically relevant environments. Alex then moved on to Dr. Angela Gronborn lab for his postdoctoral studies, where he his work uses NMR and other biophysical methods to elucidate the mechanism of cataract formation. His work is supported by Burroughs Welcome Fund, CGEP Award, and Life Science Research Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship. Welcome, Alex. All right, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Okay. And just confirm you guys are seeing the actual PowerPoint, not presenter view? That's correct. Okay, cool. So I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to speak today. I'm going to tell you what I like to call a cautionary tale of the amdated crystallins. Uh, and this is from my poster, uh, my postdoc work in Angela Grunborn's lab. So to start off a brief outline of my talk, first we're going to talk about cataracts in the islands. We're going to talk about the crystalline proteins that make up the islands. The spontaneous chemical process called deamidation, some structural studies on deamidated crystallines, and some biophysical studies on deamidated crystallines. So to understand cataracts in the islands, we have to think about the actual purpose of the islands. And the islands is this highly evolved organ that sits at the front of the eye, and its sole purpose is to focus light onto the retina. To do this, it has evolved to be extremely transparent and to have incredibly low scattering of light. So you can imagine if something were to happen to this, let's say it begins to opacify, you will have visual impairment. And this is what we know as cataracts. And that's depicted here in this figure where you see a clear lens, slightly opacified kind of pre-cataract lens, and then finally a full cataract lens. So the World Health Organization identifies cataracts as the leading cause of visual impairment worldwide. And it's not just by a little, it's something like 48% of visual impairments are due to cataracts. So uniquely, this is very much a problem for the developing world, not as much the developed world. Uh, in the United States, for example, my father recently had cataract surgery. It took about two hours. And what they do is they just make a small slit in your eye, they pull out the old lens, they put in a new one, and they send you home shortly thereafter and you know my father says his fake lens is much better than than anything he's had before but in the developing world where you don't have access to the surgical intervention cataracts are incredibly prevalent and the main cause of visual impairment so to further understand cataracts it's really essential to kind of think of the islands as what i like to call a highly evolved sack of crystallines so in this lens structure to reduce the scattering of light you remove all transcription, translation, and degradation machinery, as well as, as well as all organelles. And essentially, you just have a sack of crystalline proteins where they're concentrated upwards of 400 grams per liter and account for something like 95% of the protein mass of the islands. And the crystalline superfamily of proteins can be broken down into three categories. There's your alpha crystallins, which are your chaperone-like crystallins. And their responsibility is to keep soluble the structural crystallins, the beta and gamma crystallins. Beta and gamma crystallins are the workhorse of the islands. And they're homologous as they have these two Greek key motifs that are separated by a linker. Beta crystallins have an extended linker, and that allows for them to form a higher order oligomers, where gamma crystallins have a shorter linker, and they're monomeric in nature. So as I said, these proteins uh, in the lens, you have lost all transcription, translation, and degradation machinery. So what that means is that once these proteins are synthesized, they have to last a lifetime of an organism, or you will have formation of cataracts. And what that has caused is that's caused some incredible biophysical properties to evolve for these proteins where you have uh, TMs between 60 and 80 degrees and delta Gs of unfolding between 25 and 50 kcals per mole. These things are highly soluble as they're soluble greater than 400 grams per liter. And they're long lived as the average half-life of the crystalline proteins is 77 years. So with such incredible properties of these proteins, what's going on? What causes these oh, pretty much rocks 
to aggregate and cause cataracts? Well, one hypothesis is deamidation. Proteomic analysis of cataractus lenses has found an increase in asparagine deamidation. And asparagine deamidation is a stochastic chemical process that occurs when an asparagine side chain goes through a condensation reaction from the succinamide intermediate. The succinamide intermediate can then be hydrolyzed either symmetrically or to either the aspartate form or the isoaspartate form. When it's hydrolyzed to aspartate, you get an overall charge change of minus one and you lose the amide for the carboxylic acid. It's a rather straightforward process. When it hydrolyzes to the isoaspartate, you form a carboxylic acid, but you also extend the backbone by plus one carbon. So for a while, deamidation has been implicated in cataractogenesis and it's been studied because it's really easy to use asparagine to aspartate point mutations to mimic the overall charge change of minus one. Um, and the reason this is important is because, as I said, these proteins are highly evolved. So if we look at the tree of life, and this is for uh, chordates, we can look at beta B2 crystalline from humans all the way up through whale sharks. And you see that you have this weak negative charge ranging from minus 1.7 to minus 0 0.3 that's rather conserved throughout this uh, phylogeny. This trend holds true with gamma crystallines, such as our favorite gamma crystalline, gamma D crystalline, where through claw frogs, where we don't have as much sequence coverage for the gamma D sequences, we see that these charges are largely conserved and they're small. So introducing something like a one negative charge is changing the whole charge landscape of the molecule. Additionally, if we look further into asparagines in gamma crystallines, what we can see is in reference to gamma D crystalline, where there are seven um, asparagines, four of them are largely conserved. And from this, we can also glean some information on whether uh, aspartate formation there will be tolerable. For example, if we look at position 24 in gamma S crystalline, it's naturally an aspartate. So we would hypothesize that deamidation at that location would be rather tolerable and not really have an effect. And the same can be seen at N60 where you have an aspartate in gamma C crystalline. So to study the influence of deamidation on gamma crystallines, we go to our favorite crystal, crystalline, gamma D crystalline. Uh, gamma D crystalline is the workhouse crystalline of our lab. It's 20 kilodaltons, it's monomeric. There's seven potential sites of deamidation and about 8% of the crystalline, it accounts for 8% of the crystalline mass in the islands. Okay, uh, so we have our system, we have a problem. So we'll hypothesize here that any of the crystallines that are conserved could be uh, mutated and cause a problem. Um, the other aspect to this is where are they in the structure? In the structure here, they look the majority on the surface. So if we do a simple solvent accessible surface area calculation, you'll see that the majority of these crystal or these uh, asparagines are on the surface of gamma D crystalline, um, with the exception of N33 appears to be solvent excluded and N124 is slightly solvent excluded. So our first question was, all right, let's make these proteins and let's collect an HSQC spectra. So uh, this is an NMR focused group, but it's always good to go over an HSQC. For an HSQC, each cross peak represents the AMI backbone. And this is the N15H1 HSQC. And we have the assignment for this, so we're able to watch uh, what peaks are shifting and understand on a per residue basis how mutation is affecting the overall structure of gamma crystallines. So we did this for all seven variants, and we'll start first with the uh, N terminal domain variants. And we see N24 and N49 show minimal chemical shift perturbations, where N33D shows seemingly large chemical shift perturbations throughout the N-terminal domain. Importantly, these N-terminal domain variants show minimal CSPs throughout the C-terminal domain. So the C-terminal domain is largely unaffected. For the C-terminal domain, we see minimal CSPs, you know, local to the site of mutation and nothing real interesting going on. So the only real uh, variant here that seems interesting is N33D. Um, and if we remember that was conserved and it was also solvent uh, excluded. So that might make some sense. If we look a little bit further and we can map these onto the structure, 
we see that these contacts are all throughout the N-terminal domain and they're kind of clustered. So when we look at the mutation, the site of mutation N33, what we see is that this is kind of in this hydrogen bonding network that staples together two regions of the protein through the amide group of the asparagine. So you can tell right away that when you mutate this for an aspartate, you're no longer able to make those hydrogen bonds and thus this kind of stapling of these two structural elements by N33 or now D33 is not possible and we can see chemical shifts associated for both sides and here is the E7 chemical shift and here is the D73. The largest chemical shift here is this S34 which is directly adjacent to the mutation so that would make sense as well. So we don't believe any major structural changes are occurring here but we think that we're disrupting this hydrogen bond network. So we wanted to probe overall structure of the gamma crystallins. And to do this, we decided to use X-ray crystallography and we tried to crystallize all seven of our deamidation variants. Um, as crystallography goes, uh, we only were able to get the fraction quality crystals for two, two variants, N124D and N160D. And what we saw is that these uh, variants which showed minimal chemical shift perturbations showed nearly identical structures with their mutant structure in either blue or green and the wild type structure in gray. Um, our overall, all RMSD of the two structures was uh, to the wild type were around 0.3 angstrom squared, so they're nearly identical. So to kind of summarize all of the structural studies, we looked at a bunch of the deamidation variants by NMR and they showed minimal CSPs. We were able to crystallize two of those variants and show that the structures are essentially identical. One variant, N33D, had these intriguing chemical shifts that look to be due to disruption of this hydrogen bonding network. We don't have the structure of that yet, but we're working on that. It's been refractory to crystallization, so we're pursuing it by NMR. So overall, it doesn't look like we're changing the crystalline's structural properties. The question is, what about their biophysics? Is, this mutation altering how they interact with each other or is it altering their overall stability? So to get to that first question, is it changing how they interact with each other? We went uh, ahead to use diffusion interaction parameters, which I like to call a poor boy's uh, second variable coefficient because it's much easier to measure than second variable coefficients. So we can use dynamic light scattering and the concentration dependence of the diffusion coefficient to calculate this parameter, uh, which they refer to as KD, KD to me will always be the equilibrium constant of dissociation. So for lack of confusion, we're going to refer to this as dip. So it's similar to second variable coefficient. It reports on colloidal stability of the solution. And when it's positive, you have an attractive interaction. And when it's negative, you have a repulsive interaction. So we measured this for all seven of our deamidation variants. And what you can see is that they range between negative three and negative six, but they're all within uncertainty of the wild type. Therefore, Deamination is having very minimal interaction or influence on how these molecules interact with each other in solution. So in terms of aggregation or, um, you know, uh, self interactions, we're really not changing anything than that. Deamination isn't influencing how these molecules behave in solution. So the last question was, what about their overall uh, thermal stability? So we went ahead and we used differential scanning calorimetry. And we showed that we got TMs between 80 and 85.5 degrees C. Um, unfortunately, crystalline, despite being highly stable, does not uh, unfold reversibly. So with aggregation, you can only fit DSC data for TM. Um, but overall, with these, you know, a few degree range in TMs between these variants, there's no gross, large stability changes either. Okay. So what's going on then? I told you structurally, we're not seeing a large difference from both our NMR and crystallography data. And biophysically from our diffusion interaction parameters and our DSC, that deamidation really does not appear to be affecting gamma crystalline. And this is why I like to call this a cautionary tale. So what we did is we characterized asparagine to aspartate using genetic variation in these point mutations. And we can conclusively say that this does not appear to be affecting gamma decrystalline. What we didn't do yet 
and we're currently pursuing this, is we're char to characterize the isoaspartate product because this requires some more complex uh, chemical biology. Additionally, we need to take in context the environment. The lens environment is concentrated at upwards of 400 grams per liter of protein. Um, and, you know, brilliant studies of macromolecular crowding have demonstrated how these complex environments can influence protein, uh, protein interactions and protein stability. So we really need to take into account the uh, lens environment. So with that, I'd like to just thank the uh, group of people who've helped me with this. Uh, Matthew Whitley was a postdoc in the lab, um, and he helped with the crystal structures. Jeremy Gonzalez was a incredible undergraduate that I had in the summer of 2019 from the University of Puerto Rico. Um, I can't speak highly enough of him. The NIH for funding the lab, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, and Merck slash the LSRF for funding me. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for the mic talk. Anyone? We have time for questions. Um, any effect on the dynamics or relaxation properties of the N33G mutation? So yeah, that's a great question. We haven't measured that yet, um, but you'd imagine since you're removing that hydrogen bond, uh, there, there would be an increased dynamics. Other people who have worked on deamidation of other gamma crystallines have reported increased dynamics upon deamidation, so there, there's definitely a potential for that. Okay, thank you. I, I have one Let's question. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, you say that we want to you want to study those the, the higher concentrations. Is that a problem for techniques such as NMR or other biophysical techniques? Is you know what would be the best way to study um, such sorry, high concentrations? Sorry. Do you mind repeating that? Oh, sorry. Um, you mentioned at the end of your talk that you wanted to study sort of them in a in a crowded environment. Would would that be a problem for any biophysical techniques? What would be the best sort of biophysical technique to, to study um, at that concentration level? You know, uh, my favorite technique for this, and you know, I did my PhD in crowding, so uh, NMR is, is clearly my, my favorite idea for that, but there are a variety of other techniques that we've been interested in, maybe um, some scattering methods. Um, so there's also two more questions from the chat. Oh, so one was what determines the susceptibility of each residue to deamidation? Is it related to solvent exposure? So there's a variety of different factors that are accounted for in that. Um, it can be kind of just a structural element, how solvent exposed it is, how flexible it is in that orientation where it can form the succinamide intermediate. So if it's not in a, if it's in a rather rigid structural element and there's no side chain dynamics, you could imagine that that residue might be uh, unlikely to form or to deamidate. Um, so Phil Solenko, do you have a readout for function and is function affected? So unfortunately, uh, the crystallines don't really have a traditional readout like an enzyme activity or any sort of um, easy readout besides aggregation propensity or um, overall solubility. And um, I, yeah, there, there's not really anything good for that because these whole their function is to stay soluble and stay intact. So you're looking for a loss of solubility. Um, Aaron, stay tuned. We're working on that. We just got a beautiful new DSC this week and having fun playing with that already. So uh, the crowding agents for this would actually be using crystallines to crowd other crystallines. Um, and maybe even trying to do some reconstituted lenses. So that's a great question. Is there more aspartate or isoaspartate uh, deamidation products in the islands? And uh, is it possible that the deamidation products are heterogeneous in the islands? They're 100% heterogeneous in the islands. I, uh, I don't doubt that one bit. Uh, I don't know the exact ratio between aspartate and isoaspartate off the top of my head, but they are mixed. Um, and they're mixed sometimes at the same residue and sometimes residue differences. So, you know, there's a lot going on and, you know, it's complex. It's a simple system because the islands only has about 17 proteins in the crystalline superfamily, but at the same time, 
there's so much going on and so long lived that the complexity of it kind of adds a beauty of difficulty to it. Thank you, Alex, for sharing a great talk and for answering all these questions. I think um, Phil mentioned something again in the chat here. Maybe you can uh, type out your answer to him. Your session and it's Chris Wolby from UCL. So Chris originally is from Glasgow, then he moved south to St. John's College at University of Cambridge, where he remained for his PhD with the late Chris Dobson on biophysical and structural studies of the alpha synuclein and protein aggregation. Um, continuing his move south after his PhD with Chris, he joined the newly formed Christodoulou group at the University College of London, where he's developing and applying a mass study called translational protein folding of mass and chain directly on the ribosome. In this time, Chris has also been involved in a range of other projects and collaborations, not least the development of two-dimensional line shape analysis methods and the Titan software package. And its results uh, uh, and it's re the result of one such collaboration that he's going to talk about today. So, please, the floor is yours. Okay, that should be better. Can you hear me now? Great. Yes. Okay, so uh, thanks. It's it's really great to um, have the chance to to present and uh, you know just take the chance to thank all the the organisers for putting this uh, this meeting together. Um, you know, it's it's a great opportunity, and I really look forward to seeing what uh, what talks are going to be in the future. Uh, it's really enjoyable. So, my talk today um, is all about the protein alpha one uh, antitrypsin. Um, and this is a, a serine protease inhibitor or serpin that is uh, secreted uh, by the liver uh, into the bloodstream at high concentration, so one to three grams per liter. Uh, and it's a circulating inhibitor of elastase, neutrophil elastase. And this is a, a protease that is secreted by neutrophils uh, in response to uh, infection, inflammation. Uh, it's a potent bactericide. Uh, which is great, but it must be inactivated uh, away from the site of infection inflammation to prevent further tissue damage. Uh, now, if alpha-1 uh, biosynthesis is defective, uh, then the elastase may not be uh, effectively inactivated. This can lead to uh, degradation of the lung tissue, uh, leading to emphysema or uh, COPD. And moreover, accumulation of alpha-1 in the liver uh, can lead to uh, cirrhosis and liver damage. So it's a, a disease that can attack on two fronts. So alpha-1 deficiency uh, is largely a, a genetic disorder. It's a reasonably rare disease, um, and it's most commonly, uh, at least in Northern Europe, associated uh, with a particular variant termed the, the Z variant, uh, E342K. Uh, for various historical reasons, the, uh, the wild type itself is usually referred to as the, the M variant for running a, a medium position on a gel. So about one in 40 Northern Europeans are carriers uh, of this Z allele, and they're usually asymptomatic, although symptoms can be brought on by, by drinking or smoking. Uh, however, those uh, homozygotes, ZZ, um, have greatly depleted serum levels, uh, and this can lead to more serious uh, illness. And there are not really any good options for therapies at the moment. Um, liver transplants for an MM donor uh, can fix the root cause of the disease, if caught early, uh, but of course that carries risks and is extremely expensive. Uh, augmentation therapy, um, you know, adding in uh, exogenous uh, alpha-1 to the blood uh, is approved in the, the States, but not by NICE in the UK. Um, and it doesn't affect, uh, it doesn't address liver damage. So, um, so the work we're involved in, and particularly the work of the LOMAS group, also at UCL, is really to try and understand the molecular mechanisms that give rise to the, the pathology um, of this, and particularly associated with the Z variant. So if we turn now to the structure of uh, alpha-1, uh, it's a 45 kilodalton protein. Um, it's got a reasonably complex fold, and it's natively glycosylated at three sites, uh, resulting in about 52 kilodalton uh, molecular weight. And if I draw your attention uh, for now to the, uh, the loop uh, at the top, highlighted magenta, this is the reactor center loop. And this is the binding site for uh, substrate proteases. Um, and then following cleavage of this, of this loop, uh, alpha-1 undergoes a pretty remarkable 
uh, conformational uh, transformation in which the, the two beta strands highlighted in blue here are going to separate uh, apart. Uh, and this is going to allow insertion of the cleaved loop um, into a five-stranded beta sheet, uh, translocating the substrate protease uh, in a sort of judo flip across the entire uh, molecule. And in doing this, this um, disrupts the structure of the substrate protease, inhibiting its function. So we can see alpha-1 is a, uh, a suicide inhibitor. Uh, however, it's also possible uh, with this mechanism to get spontaneous self-insertion uh, of the, the reactor center loop into uh, the beta strand itself. Um, this leads to an active, uh, hyperstable state. Uh, it's effectively irreversible. Uh, and this means that the free energy landscape of uh, alpha-1 folding is, uh, is really interesting. The native state is metastable. It's not the thermodynamically most favorable state. Um, so this instability has got to be balanced by kinetic uh, stability. And yet it must also be able to open up rapidly enough uh, that it can react quickly once it uh, gets attacked by some substrate. And in fact, not only can the loop self-insert, but it can insert into adjacent molecules uh, leading to polymerization. Uh, and you can see here uh, an electron micrograph negative stain of some polymers that were extracted from the ER of a, of a liver obtained uh, following a transplant. Now, the Z mutation is known to strongly promote this polymerization. Um, but the mechanism is really, um, as yet, uh, unknown. Uh, nevertheless, our collaborators in the LOMASH group have very recently uh, identified um, a really interesting new molecule, a small molecule that uh, is a potent uh, binder for the Z variant. Um, it interacts strongly and it uh, strongly inhibits the polymerization. So by stabilizing the native state, um, you can slow down the transitions out towards a polymer. Um, Although you know, the flip side of this is also uh, um, inhibits the inhibitory function. Uh, but it's a really interesting molecule to be, to be trying to look at. So this is great, but you know, we still don't really have much idea of what's actually going on with the Zen and why this is so um, you know, polymerogenic. Um, there are various lines of biophysical evidence in terms of increased uh, ANS binding that suggests there may be populating some sort of intermediate structure along the way to polymerization, along the way to the polymer. Um, it's been speculated that the Z could uh, have a sort of partially loop inserted conformation in the ground states uh, or even a sort of molten globule like structure. Um, however, um, relatively recently, a crystal structure was obtained, um, declagosylated uh, of the Z variant, uh, which showed that essentially the structure uh, is identical to that of the, the wild type. Uh, you know, the, the all atom RMSD is uh, less than an angstrom, so very, very, very similar structures. Um, so what's going on? You know, this, uh, this was really not what we were expecting. Um, could it be that something is going on in solution and uh, you know, could perhaps uh, NMR um, be a route to, uh, to, to shed some light on what's going on? So uh, we began our NMR studies of alpha-1 a few years ago um, with a backbone assignment um, working on uh, NH-based uh, observations. But of course, you know, our real interest is in trying to understand what's going on with the, the Z-form. But the difficulty with the Z-form is we just can't express it. Um, despite uh, many attempts uh, from you know, our group, from the low mass group and other groups, it's, it's you know, completely unamenable to, to recombinant expression and isotopic labeling. Uh, it's, it's too aggregation prone. Um, so um, you know, we thought, well, you know, perhaps we could actually work with the human material. This is what's been used for crystallography. It's been what's been used for the biophysical studies. Um, can we um, you use natural abundance NMR, carbon-13, which is 1% abundant, and use this to purify material from human patients and actually do some structural biology on that material. Um, clearly, there are challenges associated with this in terms of the sensitivity in particular, but this gives us the opportunity to, to look at uh, you know, the, real, uh, the real deal, you know, the natively glycosylated uh, species and uh, pathogenic variants that we're interested in. Uh, so we decided to give this a go. Um, the, the preparation is reasonably straightforward. We can uh, purify alpha-1 from uh, blood serum of uh, healthy donors or uh, uh, genotype ZZ donors um, from the uh, National Alpha-1 Clinic at the uh, Royal Free Hospital, which is up the road from our lab, uh, and obtain uh, you know, nice uh, active monomer material. Um, in terms of the, uh, the NMR measurements themselves, um, you know, we settled after some optimization on a gradient selected methyl sulfast HMQC. So looking at methyl groups, both for the relatively high natural abundance of carbon-13 and also the, their good relaxation properties exploiting the methyl effect. Um, we also did a bit of optimization of um, 
you know, sensitivity, so the sample concentration to make sure we don't get um, polymerization during the acquisition and also the temperature, so to balance, you know, aggregation and uh, uh, tumbling. So, you know, with that, here's a spectrum of uh, M. So this is the wild type protein. So this is 400 micromolar. So effectively four micromolar of um, NMR active material. Um, so this is acquired for three and a half days at, at 900 megahertz. Um, and I think, you know, for, for all of this, it's, it's a pretty reasonable spectrum. You know, this is natively glycosylated, um, 52 kilodaltons, um, you know, ex vivo. And, uh, you know, we've got pretty uh, good resolution of most of the peaks. There's a very high dynamic range in the spectrum. The signal to noise for peaks is varying some sort of five to 500 or so. Um, but we can really um, you know, see pretty much what we're expecting. I should say with, with this spectrum and all the other spectra, we verify the um, integrity and activity of our samples before and after acquisition biochemically. And we also interleave 1D measurements and translational diffusion measurements throughout the acquisition to make sure that we're, uh, you know, we don't have any degradation or polymerization going on. So to make progress, we need a methyl assignment for this. Um, we, uh, we took a sort of twofold strategy. First of all, um, correlating down from methyl groups to the existing backbone assignment to our uh, C-alpha, CB to carbon alchemical shifts. Uh, and then secondly, um, combining that with a, a 4D nosy based approach to get a through space connectivity. Um, something to, to, to note that might be uh, useful for folk, we actually used a SOFAST um, HMQC experiments in this nosy. And despite the fact we were dealing with producer material, we got uh, really effective uh, longitudinal relaxation enhancements, uh, which meant that we could get very, very good sampling for a 4D, and that gives a great reconstruction using SMILE, um, which we then you know, analyze manually. Um, so you know, we did try various automated methyl assignments, and you know, in this case, we didn't get particularly great results. So we, we actually just worked with things manually. Uh, and in the end, we've validated a few resonances by um, direct site directed uh, Mutagenesis. So here you can see the sort of final um, coverage of, of methyl spins in the molecule and uh, the NOE connectivities um, that we've got here. So we get a pretty good coverage across the molecule and um, only a few unassigned spins, which tend to be ones that are disordered and overlapping NOE. So with that, we can compare our uh, recombinant uh, spectrum with the, the ex vivo spectrum. And um, oh, I'm just realizing the, uh, the figure legend is, uh, is labeled incorrectly. So the, uh, the recombinant is in blue and the, the wild type ex vivo is, and, uh, is in magenta here. So uh, apologies for that. We can see that we've got uh, small chemical shift perturbations, um, but you on the whole get pretty similar um, confirmation. Interestingly, there are a couple of peaks that highlight in gray boxes where we actually seem to see some, uh, some splitting. So we seem to see double peaks in the ex vivo material. Um, you know, these could be coming either from some sort of you know, slow conformational exchange or potentially from uh, heterogeneity in the glycans that are attached to this material. Um, if we look at these uh, chemical shift perturbations in the structure, uh, we can see that uh, you know, they're, they're reasonably small. Um, they are generally localized to the glycan attachment sites. This is the, the dominant uh, glycan isoform modeled on the, the crystal structure. And the three Peaks that are showing doubling are also in the sort of vicinity, uh, approximately these glycans. So this is maybe suggesting that you've got some covalent differences uh, between isoforms that are having a, a minor impact on the conformation uh, at these points. Um, this, this is our best model at the moment, at least. Um, to look into the heterogeneity a little bit more, we compared our sp spectrum from a single donor with that that we have obtained from a pooled sample from multiple donors. Uh, we see here, I mean, the spectra are essentially identical. Um, there are no chemical shift perturbations, no changes in intensity, and no changes in the peak splitting or the, the ratio of these. So whatever is causing this, uh, this splitting and this heterogeneity, um, it's certainly, you know, the variation is greater within the individual than between different individuals. Um, and the fact that we can use pooled samples here is going to be important for the Z, uh, where we'll struggle to obtain material. So moving on to that, we spent uh, just under a year uh, going up to the, uh, the clinic um, at the hospital every couple of weeks to collect uh, blood samples from donors. So, you know, these, uh, you know, this took a while because ZZ patients are um, rare. Um, they're also pretty ill, so they can't give as much blood, um, particularly um, after uh, the end of the queue at the hospital to take all sorts of uh, other tests. Uh, and also they're ill because they don't have much uh, 
alpha-1 in the blood anymore. So um, you know, we need a lot more of it to obtain the material. Uh, in the end, we obtained a sample here pulled from uh, a total of 33 patients. Um, so this is, there's not a spectrum that's easily repeated. Um, but again, we have 400 micromolar, uh, effectively 4 micromolar, and this was acquired for just over seven days at, at 900 megahertz. Uh, so we can see from this, you know, we've got a very high quality spectrum again. Um, you know, it's dispersed, so it's clearly folded, not the molten globule that's been hypothesized previously. Um, we only have a single confirmation through peak counting. And if we then compare the spectrum with that of the M, of the wild type, we can see we have fairly extensive chemical shift uh, perturbations. So clearly the confirmation of Z in solution is different from that of the wild type. So uh, you know, the crystal structure is not capturing what is going on in solution. Um, you know, beyond that, we've, we've tried to assign uh, or attribute chemical shift changes uh, within Z. Um, so this is not an assignment, I should stress you. We don't direct evidence, but we've tried to build up our um, attributions as conservatively as possible. So starting off with residues not showing any chemical shift perturbations and then working up through larger shift changes and trying to build a model that's also consistent with the structure with residues that are near the sites of the mutation. Um, so we, yeah, th this is tricky and it's, it's a critical point, but you know, we've tried to be as careful as, uh, as we can with this. Um, so when we look at these uh, chemical shift perturbations in the structure, uh, we can see that they're now um, reasonably widespread. They're extending um, up to 30 angstroms to the site of mutation um, down you know, to some of these key regions associated with both the function but also the uh, polymerization. So these key beta strands in blue and the, the helix that are covering these, uh, the class helix. So this is some suggestion that there are conformational changes going on in these areas associated with this mutation. Uh, on top of that, a lot of these regions are also associated with intensity, with line broadening. So we've got uh, intensity losses. So this is the first indication that perhaps there's some sort of dynamics going on that might be um, associated with the variant. To change tack slightly, um, we then decide we want to look at this inhibitor binding uh, by NMR and try and see what's going on there. So using the recombinant protein, um, you know, we titrate it and we found that as we might expect for a very high affinity binder, um, binding was in slow exchange, so we had to do a reassignment um, of the spectrum, again, using a sort of 4D nosy approach. Uh, and we can see here, we got uh, essentially a complete assignment and fairly large widespread chemical shift changes around the binding site. We then um, titrated this ligand in to the ex vivo material. Uh, and to our surprise, we found that the spectra of ligand bound M and Z were completely identical. I mean, just a very few chemical shift changes directly around the site mutation itself, but otherwise, um, you know, no differences. Um, and this, this is really remarkable, this surprised us. So clearly ligand binding is dragging both of these states into a very, you know, into a common conformation, into a common structure. Uh, more than that, when we look at the, uh, the shift relative to the unbound states, uh, we saw that the chemical shifts of the Z80, so the mutant, were collinear and about 25% of the way between the wild type and those of the bound state. Um, so, you know, this, this is really interesting because collinear shifts correlated chemical shift changes like this are really an ambiguous indication of uh, chemical exchange on a fast time scale relative to chemical shift change. So what we think we've got going on is a rapid exchange between a native state and an intermediate state, which is stabilized upon ligand binding. So the ligand drags both the M and the Z to this intermediate like state where it then binds. The Z itself is populating this to about 25% or so in solution, uh, whereas the, the M, the, uh, the population of the state is pretty sparse. And based on the largest chemical shift differences we observe on ligand binding, we can infer that you know, this exchange must be on a sub-millisecond time scale. So it's got to be very rapid. Um, so you know, this, this is really interesting because this tells us clearly now your Z is uh, sampling an intermediate state at equilibrium. It's got a substantial population. It's on a sub-millisecond time scale. And contrary to all our expectations, our new small molecule ligand uh, doesn't, in fact, bind to the native state of the protein as we expected, but it, it's binding and stabilizing instead the disease-associated intermediate state that's being populated in the Z. Um, and in hindsight, this makes a lot of sense. See, this accounts for the selectivity we see towards the Z variant. Um, it's selecting out your know, population as a confirmational selection mechanism. Uh, and it also accounts um, for some data I'm not shown here, which is that the difference in the affinity between the wild type and the Z is driven by differences in the association rate and the on rate rather than dissociation rate. 
Um, and this model also rationalizes you know, our previous, the previous crystallographic and biophysical data. You know, clearly crystallization is you know, bringing the Z back into the ground state confirmations, where it's essentially equivalent to the M. Um, but the biophysical data, ENS binding fluorescence, is picking up signs in this intermediate state and the rapid exchange. Uh, and finally, you know, it's, it's clear that you know, stabilization, even though we're, we're binding and stabilizing the disease-associated intermediate state, this is still a pretty effective strategy to inhibit polymerization. It's blocking further transitions along the polymerization pathway. And in fact, by inadvertently targeting the intermediate associated with the disease, we are providing selectivity for this variant um, on top of that. So that can account for the, the difference in affinities. Uh, so with that, I'll finish and just thank the people who are involved. So uh, this is a close collaboration with Alistair Jagger. A, this is his PhD work and then uh, part of his postdoc. Um, I should thank James Irving um, in the Lomas group um, for answering all my, my stupid questions about uh, alpha-1 biology and uh, John for all the support uh, in all that we've been doing here. Uh, and a particular thanks to you as well to uh, Sarah Whitaker and everyone at Birmingham who have been very generous with the uh, allocation of NMR time for this project. Uh, and with that, uh, thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, please. The floor is open for questions. So, Peter Selenko asking, very, very cool story, Pete. Did you analyze, quantify glycosylation states and possible difference between M and Z? Um, yes, we, we, did some, we did some work on this. Um, we did a little bit of mass spec. Um, we sent some samples across. We didn't see any differences in the glycoforms. Uh, I don't know the data would be enough to say there are not differences in the, the ratios of different isoforms, but uh, from what I, I recall from the data, we didn't see any differences in the isoforms themselves. So another question so, from Thomas Schmidt. Are you planning to measure any kinetics like that? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's, it's worth bearing in mind. You know, these these spectra themselves, you know, took several days to acquire. Um, so you know, a, a CEST experiment, you're looking at uh, you know, an extra um, sort of you know, fifty planes of that. I think you know, um, Sarah has been generous with the NMR time, but I think that might be pushing it. Uh, having said that, though, you know, we now know what we're looking for. We've got an idea that this intermediate exists. So certainly, we are going back to the wild type. Um, and you know, trying to engineer some milder mutations where we might have a hope of, of observing this in a form where we can characterize it in more detail. So, um, yeah. Next question is from Igor Vicky. Did, did you have any difficulty transferring assignment from the recombinant protein to the vivo sample at any residue, or was it relatively straightforward? Uh, it wasn't straightforward. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we took um, we took a lot of care with. Um, certainly, uh, where you have small perturbations, that was that was straightforward enough. Um, what was helpful actually was when we realised that we had this this collinearity um, on binding the drug. That helped resolve some of the ambiguities that we had um, because we could then say, okay, well, if if most residues are, are behaving this way, then now it's clear where a couple of ambiguous ones are going. Um, there were a small number of residues, particularly near the site mutation, that we just couldn't track, and we, we've not attempted to follow those. Uh, another question from Phil. Can you use the compound to stabilize recombinant Z material? Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's something that we could try to, to, yeah, to express in the presence of the, of the ligand. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth a shot. It might be difficult to get the compound out again afterwards. Um, because it's a, it's a very high affinity, it's about a two nanomolar affinity for, for the Z. Um, but uh, you know, perhaps with some extensive dialysis, um, we, could, uh, we could do this. Um, it's, it's a good idea. One more question. What does ligand binding imply about disease? Uh, what does it imply about the disease? So I think it's, it's beginning to address questions about you know, what the, the nature of the states that we have we have here are clearly this is a protein that has got a very complex energy landscape. You know, we are we're trying to understand you know, what the um, kind of early steps uh, might be, both in the 
uh, insertion, you know, in the polymerization, and and also in the in the function. Um, you know, at the moment, you know, we don't have a clear um, picture either of what the structure of the polymers are. So there's a few competing models uh, there. So you know, there's there's various kind of bits of work in progress. They're trying to understand what the polymer structure is. So uh, what's clear from what we were seeing here is that we've got this state that's being opened up very rapidly. Um, I think you know, this has been an uh, a key area of uncertainty in this field for, for quite a while, what the nature of these various intermediates are. There are so many of them in postulated by, by different methods. And I think you know, here we've got the first clear picture of, of what's going on, what the population is, and, and even what some of the timescales are with its formation. Um, and based on the fact we've got a crystal structure, the ligand bound form, we can sort of infer um, some of the shift changes, you know, some of the structural changes associated with the intermediate state. So the ligand is uh, binding to what would otherwise be a sort of cryptic binding site. So this intermediate seems to involve opening up a cavity um, in the protein. So um, yeah, it's it's beginning to, to give us some ideas what might be going on structurally. Okay. We have one more question from Louis Wang. Is the Z variant from the patient less aggregation prone than the recombinant protein? Yes, um, it, it is. So the, the, the presence of the, the glycans um, it generally seems to be protective against polymerization. Um, and in fact, you know, if, we, if we do polymerization assays, so we can induce polymerization at high concentrations or, or by raising the temperature, um, we actually see a much clearer, um, cleaner polymerization. Uh, we see nice laddering of dimers, tribin, and so forth with uh, ex vivo material, whereas uh, recombinant, albeit recombinant wild type material, tends to give uh, a little bit more of a smear. So yeah, the glycans clearly um, influence the, the polymerization uh, as well, and they seem to stabilize it. Okay, uh, I see there is no other question for the moment. I would like to remind the participants that they can still uh, reply to the poll about what you would like to have after the scientific talk. So there is still, the poll open is on the bar, at the bottom. So if anyone wants still to say something.